Now, when it comes to fly rods, it can be pretty daunting. Uh, there's that many models and brands and weights and yeah, and there's a little bit of garbage that goes on about all of them. But essentially, most fly rods are all pretty good nowadays. I think your best bet is to come into a shop and then ask somebody behind the counter who does it for a living and say, this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go, this is how much I want to spend, what do you reckon? And most good fly shops will have an area where you can go out and cast. So we're not asking you to, to make a decision based on that. You need to go out and cast it. And everyone has their own individual actions and what sort of suits them. And they're literally like Harry Potter's wand, you know, a fly rod will pick its owner. And that's what it's really like. You'll just pick up a rod and just cast and it just suits. And that's what it's all about. Try something first and you're going to have a much better idea. But initially, you want to know where you're going to fish. If you're going to fish mainly small little streams, then you need a lighter rod, whether it be perhaps a four weight or even a two weight. If you're going to fish big rivers or go to um, New Zealand or Tassie and do a lot of lakes and that, well, you're going to need a nine foot six weight. You know? And they are a little bit, fortunately or unfortunately, they're a little bit like golf clubs. So um, there you will be a specific rod with a line weight to suit different areas that you're going to fish. So down the track, you might find yourself owning three or four or uh, you could even own a few more than that, but uh, different rods because they're going to be suited to different purposes. But uh, come down and speak to the guy behind the counter. He's going to have an understanding of what you want to achieve and how you're going to do it, and he'll help you and point you in the right direction. Now, when it comes to fly reels, there is a massive selection out there. But to break it down, um, you can spend a fortune and uh, you can spend a couple of bob and still get something okay. The fly reel, I think, is still the least important thing about the whole shooting match. But it's just nice to have a really nice reel that just works whenever you need it to do. I guess the main differences are you go from die cast, which is um, you know, empty VB cans melted down and poured into like a, a reel. Uh, and they're much cheaper to produce. Uh, but overall, they're still quite good. They're in what we call a large arbor. So if you can see in there, that's all filled in um, so that the reel is wound up in much bigger loops and it doesn't have that little pigtail memory into the fly line as well. So that's a, that's a really good reel um, and it'll do everything you need to do and they're like $70, so you don't need to spend a lot. I guess then it jumps up to your imported from, from Asia, uh, a machine. So that's one block of uh, 6061 uh, aircraft aluminium and it's ground down. So that's where you get a lot of the strength from that. So that makes it a much, much stronger reel, particularly if you're knocking it and things like that or falling over. This won't bend, whereas a, a die cast will. It doesn't have that strength in that. Also, you tend to get like a better drag system in, in a lot of your, your machined reels as well. Slightly more expensive, you jump up to about $150. Reel, uh, up to what are literally the best in the world, the Galvin reels, which are made in America, lifetime guarantee, and are literally indestructible. They've got um, you know, a drag system that you could stop a, uh, a train, literally. Uh, and they're probably your best in the world. So for a reel that's gonna last a lifetime, uh, if you can get something like that, Galvin's, because that's all I use, because they're the best in the world. Now, when it comes to fly lines, we are spoiled for choice. There's literally, you know, a million different good quality lines out there. It goes from like the top of the, the range scientific angler in the shark wave, uh, the Rio Grande uh, perceptions, a lot of great lines in that, uh, to air flows, and there's a lot of specific lines for a specific purpose. And that's a lot of information for you to have to decipher. What's probably best is you come into the shop and say, this is what I want to do, this is you know, the fish I'm going to be targeting, and we'll be able to find one that's going to suit you. What I will say though is I tend to use a weight forward. You know, Double taper is a thing of the past. Nobody buys double tapers anymore. You buy a weight forward line and in a nice dull colour. If we were fishing for hatchery fish, we could use a bright orange, uh, things that, you know, because they don't know to be frightened, you know, like a wary sort of uh, stream fish. I use a dull colour and that will blend in, once that lands on the water, to a fish anyway, that could just look like a stick or you know, a, a bit of bark falling off. It's not really a frightening colour. If you start to get into a lot of the, these sort of bright sort of colours like, like that, you're going to find that that's so unnatural and it just alerts the fish that something could be wrong. And that's what we don't want to do. We want the, him to see the fly as the only thing he sees and not bring the attention to anything else. So come into the shop and we can run through all the attributes that they, all these lines have got and pick out one that's going to suit you. But uh, buy the line because next to the rod, that's the most important thing and they're going to last a long time and put your fly to where it needs to be.
Now, when it comes to litres and tippets, it can be a little bit daunting. There's 12 foot, 9 foot, 3X, 7X, 9X. Don't get too worried about it. I think there's reasons to have a really long leader and long tippet and all that, but the longer it is, the less control you're going to have. So right at the start, let's keep it quite basic and quite short. So let's start off with a nine foot leader. I'd probably go, for example, a nine foot in uh, a three X. And three X is around about eight pound. What we want to do is start off thick and go to thin. And that helps with its turnover. And also the weakest point is going to be nearer the fly. So if we do an eight pound leader in a nine footer, and we put on four X tippet, which is around about six pound. That's going to do most of your fishing. And most of your fish are not going to be able to break that. So if we start with that sort of system, down the track, we can look to have, you know, perhaps going lighter, maybe, you know, even, even a four pound tippet on your smaller streams, uh, or the use of fluorocarbon as opposed to mono if we want to sink under the surface or perhaps even using nymphs to get down. But initially, we've got a lot to think about at the start anyway. Let's keep it basic. We we'll use quite a heavy leader and then make the tip a little bit um, lighter than that and we're going to be on the right track. Now, when it comes to waders, there's quite a few options. I guess we all started with like PVC type waders, uh, you know, with the gum boot attached, and they're okay as well, and a good um, entry level price point. Once you've sort of been doing the fly fishing for a little while, you will build up to some breathable waders. Uh, what you want to do, they, they'll come in the range of either, say, like your, your chest or even in a, um, in a waist model, which is sort of handy if you're not wading too deep, or even into. Um, some thigh waders as well if you're just around lake edges. So there's certainly uh, a range of, of waders to suit your needs. They do come with a stocking foot as well. And it's very comfy and it lasts a long time. So you, you put on a good pair of uh, solid wading boots and you're gonna be right for some, some really good fishing because you tend to do a lot of walking. What you wanna be looking for in your waders is to have um, like double protection below the knee. That's your drama area. And it's not a bulletproof material. It's made to be lightweight and breathable. You don't get hot and sweaty. But this extra layer below the knee certainly protects against, you know, sticks and rocks and, and, and blackberry bushes and things like that. Uh, a good safety wading belt is very important. So if you do go into the drink, you're not going to fill up with water. Uh, and some good straps and uh, quite often now, a lot of them will have like hand warmers. So um, it can keep you quite warm and comfortable. Uh, and a decent set of waders is going to be something that's going to last quite a long time and allow you to catch a lot more fish. Now on the end of the, the waders we need a decent set of wading boots. There's quite a few different models around. What we're really looking for is a good rubber sole. This is a Vibram sole which is nice and aggressive and gives you really good grip on slimy rocks. Um, there's various models there that you can also attach studs to which gives you a little bit of extra bite if there's a little bit of moss you know, or wet grass and things like that as well. All the way up to their guide series which is a, a very high quality boot um, that's going to take a lot of knocks and abrasions and really look after your feet. Because at the end of the day you're going to do a lot of walking and if your feet are not barking you're having a lot more fun. Now there's a lot of accessories that you can get into with fly fishing. From little things like booties, if you're going to wet wade, perhaps either when it's, it's really hot in Australia or perhaps in New Zealand where there's not as many snakes, um, to a range of different things from, from uh, wading staffs, which can give you a little bit more stability uh, in some of these larger rivers. And they fold up nice and uh, easily that you can fit on your, your wading belt so they're not too cumbersome. Uh, now when it uh, comes to wet weather gear, it's very important that you buy some good stuff. Something like the uh, Stalker uh, three layer wading jacket is ideal. It's very light, you don't get hot and sweaty in it. A lot of features through it where we've got like cuffs that's tighten up around your, your wrist. So as you're waving that fly rod around, uh, water doesn't trickle down and give you a wet arm. Uh, nice hand warmer pockets, big pockets for big fly boxes, water resistant zips, uh, you know, and a couple of little, little zingers in there that you can put, um, you know, some forceps or clippers and things like that. That's also some of the, the better ones we'll have, like in the back there, a little, a little zippered pocket to put a drink or your lunch and things like that. So uh, buy something that's going to keep you dry and warm and breathable as well. And you're going to have a lot of fun out on the water, even if it is pouring with rain. And when it comes to nets, I think they're very important because it allows you to get the fish before he's literally buggered and before he can do any harm to himself, like I'm bashing around on the rocks and things like that. So I love to use a net. You go from a traditional style like these lovely timber nets made in Australia by John Bradley. They're a fantastic thing to have. 
or what I tend to use a lot of lately is the McLean's net, which are a New Zealand net. Um, and they come in a few different ranges of, of knotless mesh to a rubberized coating, nice on the fish. But the biggest plus is they have scales on the bottom. So uh, I call it a lie detector. So when you need to know how much that fish weighs, the McLean's net will tell you. Now I'm going to make these flies very simple. If we started off with a nymph, something that lives, say, under rocks for a couple of years until it swims to the surface and hatches to a flying insect, that a wet fly like that will look much thinner and not have much hackle around it and that will essentially sink. Then it goes to a dry fly and that could be a flying insect, so something that just floats on the water. Uh, that could be a nymph that's hatched into to that for it to, to fly away or it could even be a grasshopper or a cricket, something that's fallen into the water. And then we've also got something that imitates perhaps a yabby or a mud eye, uh, and that's a wet or a streamer fly. So essentially that's your three types of flies for fresh water, and there's plenty of variances in between, but that's basically your three different types of flies. Now when it comes to selecting flies, it can be a little bit daunting. You come into a shop like this and there's you know 300 different ones and different sizes. Don't be too intimidated, you can just ask for help and just say this is where I'm going to be fishing, this is what I want to catch, what do you think I should use? And you will pick it up, you know, the more you do and the more you learn. So uh, don't be afraid to ask and don't be too, too worried about not knowing the answers to everything. But if, if it comes down to, I think presentation is very important rather than just a particular fly, but at certain times the fly is very important. But if I had six flies that I would use to save my life virtually anywhere in the world, I would use an Adams parachute in a 16. That's going to cover almost all your, your mayflies, which is one of the dominant uh, trout food species. We also have like a blowfly, which works as you would have seen on quite a few of our shows in New Zealand, and it's, it's almost cheating, it's that good. Uh, in Australia, I'd perhaps swap that to um, a red humpy or something like that. A rubber-legged um, royal stimulator is amazing on all of our rivers that have perhaps caddis or grasshoppers. Um, Hubert's red, you all know how often I tie that on because it just imitates the spent uh, mayfly just incredibly and the fish just keep eating it. Um, Hubert's Bismarck is another little um, tungsten nymph that I use in the 16 quite often. And then if I'm searching, I use the, um, the green magoo, which is just a magnificent fly that just works you know, throughout all our lakes, both in, in Australia, New Zealand, literally all around the world. So uh, obviously there's reasons to have one of every fly, but initially just keep it quite simple. Don't worry about um, you know, overthinking things. Just put a nice little fly on, cast it into the fish's mouth and everything will just work out fine. Now fly tying is something you want to get into. There's various kits that you can buy that will hold a lot of the different gear to get you started. Uh, it helps to perhaps even join a club or something like that or do a course where you can learn how to tie flies. And once you get the, um, the initial techniques right, all the flies are tied almost the same. So um, spend a bit of time and you get a lot of enjoyment out of tying a fly yourself casting it to a fish and getting him to take something that you've made up yourself. So um, spend a bit of time, learn how to do it, pick out, there's quite a range of different vices that you can get as well. So pick out one that's going to suit you uh, and your budget and you'll uh, get a lot of enjoyment on those days when you can't spend it fishing. Now a couple of things what you're going to use all the time uh, are very important. One is floatant, which is fly sauce. Uh, I use that because I find that's the best. And what you need to do is put that onto your dry flies before they get wet. Uh, that'll keep them floating nice and high, uh, much easier to see and easy to detect takes. Once the fly does get wet by either catching a few fish or it slowly just absorbs water over time, we put it into a product called Shake and Float and that's a desiccant that you put the fly in, give it a shake, that um, absorbs all the water, completely dries it out, then reapply the floatant and just keeps those flies um, right up high on, on the water and uh, working much better for you. Now there is literally a million accessories that you can use throughout fly fishing. Initially though, just take your time and, and find a use for, for what you need and then buy it. So don't overload everything uh, too much at the start. Uh, what you will need though, and what I use all the time, is a tie fast 
combo knot tie and that's got clippers and also the tool to tie the nail knot which is quite a difficult knot but with this tool it just makes it so much easier. So that's something you will use all the time. Uh, I also use the catch and release uh, tool which gets the fly out of the fish very quickly and easily uh, with less um, harm to the fish. That's an amazing tool to, to use. And I also use for my indicator fishing, um, if using nymphs and things like that, quite down deep, from the Strike Indicator Company in New Zealand. And they make an adjustable system to, um, to move your indicators. And I'll use that from, with nymphs or, or the, the new bead systems and things like that. So it's a great tool. So they're the three that I would use all the time. And then as you go, you'll find different um, reasons to have um, different other accessories as well that improves your fishing because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about having a great time on the water and enjoying yourself. Now when you're fly fishing, you're always on the move, so you've got to carry everything that you're going to need. Fly vests are a very traditional way of doing that, um, and they have lots of pockets you can fill up with literally everything. Big pockets as well for your fly boxes, and there's a few different designs and price points as well. What I tend to use myself is, I tend to use one of these um, uh, packs, and there, what I find is a little bit lighter as well, uh, a lot more aerators, don't get anywhere near as hot, and uh, you've got all the things you need, you know, for some big fly boxes, little zingers, fold down little bits and pieces. And you can also attach a lot of these, they're interchangeable with a much larger backpack. So if I'm perhaps guiding or something like that, or, or I'm away all day and I might need lunch and a drink and uh, a raincoat, all the business there, you can fit it in that. Or if I'm just going for short little, you know, after, you know, perhaps a couple of hours, I can just wear the light little back. So there's a few different ones. Find out what, you know, is going to suit you and what's more comfortable. Try them all on and then make a decision because they're going to last a long time and give you a lot of fun wearing them. Now with trout fishing in particular, colour plays an important role. I'm sure uh, trout are very spooky at the best of times, but if there's something waving around uh, a little bit more, it's going to frighten them. What you want to do is tend to blend in a little bit. So you might find, say, in the middle of summer, you'd wear like a nice light shirt like that because it's going to blend into you know, all the, um, the faded grass and things like that. If you're going to be around more bush uh, lined areas, you might go in a little bit darker or maybe in the middle of winter, you might tend to use something like that where it's all a little bit greener. Uh, the same if you're getting into some, some you know, perhaps salt water stuff on some sandy areas, you might go for the very light colours as well. So um, try and blend in with your environment and uh, try, don't try and move very quickly because that's going to alert the fish of your presence. Uh, sneak around a little bit and the fish won't know you're there until you've already hooked.